Uh, lords, ladies, gentle MBs, welcome to what is hopefully the most you're gonna think about power curves and collectible object games all year. My name is Dylan Exabyte Mayo. Twitter handle is up there on the screen. I'll show it at the end. You can always get in talk with me on there. I tend to reply to a lot of questions and retreat stupid, funny stuff. Uh, give you a quick history on me. I've been playing TCGs since they've been around with Magic's launch and been making fan efforts, including Chaos Magic, which you see some uh, insight in that that went into like the Plane Chase product that came out, and I've been play professionally making trading card games since about 2000. Um, first trading card game that I professionally worked on was Magi Nation. There was a Game Boy Color RPG and trading card game that came out for that, and I was one of the designers on that. Uh, I also started my own trading card game company, Tenacious Games, where I created the Spoils, which has just terminated its run, giving it maybe the fifth longest run in TCG history, which is kind of neat. Um, after that, I went and worked on Magic, kind of on the bench. I was working on a digital push for Wizards, but I was in the pit, so I was there for drafts and what have you, did hole filling. I was not a major uh, designer on Magic, but was there in the periphery. And since then, I've been working at Pokemon as the main person in charge of the Pokemon card game outside of Japan and Korea. I take the game that comes out of Japan and localize it and distribute it, make the products for all the markets around the world for just over nine years now. So of course, given the background on these games today, we will mainly be talking about Hearthstone. <laughs> Hearthstone has probably the simplest mana system of any major trading card game, which makes it really easy to be the basis for this talk. When you're talking about a mana system, what you're really talking about is these numbers up here that tell you how much it costs cards to be put into play. Um, in Hearthstone, if you are unfamiliar with Hearthstone, at the beginning of each turn you will gain one mana, and then you can spend that mana to play your cards each turn. At the beginning of turn two, you'll have two mana. At the beginning of turn three, you will have three mana, and so on in that fashion. So to play those cards costs, you can play the one that costs two on turn two, or any turn after that, and you'll have some leftover mana. When you're talking about the ratio between how much a card costs and how powerful it is, there are two things to consider. The cost, which we've got highlighted up here, and everything else in the card is generally the power, and that's this bottom part down here. Um, so as you can see, these are all what are known as vanilla creatures. They just have power and life points, and as you pay more cost, you get more power for that. But how that's related is a little interesting to start looking at. So we can align these on a chart pretty easily. Um, we can put them, we can label an axis for cost along the bottom, one through nine I've got down there. However, aligning the axis for power is really hard to do. It is tough to look at a card in most card games, even simple cards as this, and give it a number. It's tough to say that that card has 17 power, or this card has 15 power. But we can gauge relatively the power levels of these cards and align them on the chart like this and we get a nice little line that goes through there, but that is for these very simple cards and don't encompass the entirety of the cards within the game there. So at seven in Hearthstone, you can get War Golem, which is a seven seven with no card text on it at all. You can also get Prophet Velen, which is a seven seven for seven that has a lot of text on it that is very powerful. So obviously Prophet Velen is a much more powerful card than War Golem. In fact, it would be hard pressed to make a 7-7 seven, seven for seven mana with text on it that would be even more powerful than Prophet Velen without making a card that would go in every deck for a couple years. <laughs> so we can arrange these cards on power-wise on the same cost slot. We've got War Golem here. We are gonna throw the line back up there. There's Prophet Velen, and here's our good friend, Dr. Boom. So these are all cost seven, but clearly do not all have the same amount of power. So even as we zoom in on seven, there's going to be a range of powers at that seven cost. So what that gets into is talking about how much you get for seven is even better than what you get for five plus two. And that becomes pretty obvious when you start looking at some of the best cards at various mana costs. Dr. Boom, probably one of the best seven cost cards ever made in Hearthstone. However, that card is better than Loathub, which is probably one of the five best five cost cards ever made in Hearthstone, and Anoyatron, which has been just ubiquitous while it was legal 
in the standard format in Hearthstone. And one of the easiest ways to look at that is if Dr. Boom were to block Loathib, it would still be threatening seven damage. So even, w even though it has taken out that five cost card, it doesn't go down in its value. Plus it's got the boom bots going on. So you actually get more at seven than just five plus two. And that comes into a lot of reasons and ends up giving us what looks more like a curve as you increase the cost. You get more power, but it isn't a linear amount of power increase. The amount of power you get at each cost point goes up a bit more curvy. The reason that they're more than power lines is expensive cards have to be better than cards that adapt to their cost. For example, the game could end before you even get to seven, so you might never even be able to play Dr. Boom. So that means that if you make it to that depth of point in a game, as you get that many resources, you have to have sufficient payoff for waiting that long to play that card. The more expensive a card is, the less flexible it is. You can't play Dr. Boom before turn seven in a normal game. However, a two cost card like, uh, the golem, you can play at any time that you have at least two mana, and if you come to a turn later on in the game where you have perhaps five or six mana, you can play that with other cards. And that's also one of the great reasons that Hearthstone has the hero power, is it helps smooth out your mana curve. At any time, if you've played, if you're on turn six, you play a four cost turn, you've got two left over, you can hit your hero power button, and that will help you smooth out and use all of your resources every turn. The similar thing with the Annoyatron there. You could play that extra two at any point that you have left over, that much left over mana. So uh, the cheaper card is, the easier it is to play at any point of the game and why you don't need as much payoff for that card and why you have to linearly, non-linearly curve up your power as you go up in cost. And this gets into the point of additional power at each cost. Here are two pretty standard cards, War Golem and River Croc. And River Croc has an, an equivalent card that is clearly just a bit better than River Croc. Flame Juggler is the exact same stats for the exact same mana cost. However, you also get to deal one damage to a random enemy. You could make Flame Juggle and War Golem and make exactly War Golem stats and give it that same, same ability. However, that War Golem with the special ability is not as much better than Flame Juggler is. And this is where we start getting into weird terminology things and why you can't just say a card is more powerful than another card and what I'm trying to get across here starts to get a little complicated and we're gonna to try to show it on this cool chart here. How good a card is depends on the ratio of how far the cur off the curve it is. So these two cards can be put up, these are the base cards with no stats, can be put up on the curve here and when we add Flame Juggler, it is just that little red mark up off the curve whereas the Flame Juggle and War Golem is also that same little red mark off the curve. But the Flame, Juggle and War, Flame Juggler is way better than Flame Juggler War Golem because moving that much off the curve at two is worth way more than moving that much off the curve at seven. To make a card that is that much better than War Golem, you have to do something like Prophet Velen or Dr. Boom to be that more, more impressive at the same cost. And that ratio is kind of the thing that we really need to look at at all times when you're talking about how good a card is and why power isn't just a good enough word because War Golem is a more powerful card than Flame Juggler, but it's probably a much worse card than Flame Juggler. And so we've been always trying to come up with good terminology for that, uh, for that ratio. Uh, me and a friend of mine used to call it Jedi. That's probably a little too trademarky to get around. Uh, Extra Credits did an episode where they had talked to us about that and said something about that being like an official term that we'd used at Wizards. It was just something that we had kind of kicked around at one point. Uh, I've been thinking of trying to come up with a neat name, maybe Marks or something for it. Uh, anyway, moving on, we can see our Flame Juggle and War Golem just does not really stack up with those other cards there. And so that, that's why the ratio is so much more important than the actual like scalar of how much extra power you're getting when you're balancing a card. Uh, so when we're gonna look at other games, you get to get into different cost structures and those cost structures have a circular informing of both the cost and the balancing of those individual objects within the game. 
In a Hearthstone game card, the only thing that you can really do to make the cost any different is put it in a class versus have it be a neutral card. That second card, Druid of the Claw, can only be played in a Golem deck, but otherwise they just both cost five. But when you get into Magic the Gathering, they have a far more complex mana system. If you're not familiar with it, up in that upper right corner is the cost for those two cards, Tidings and Sliver Queen. Both of them have a converted mana cost or total cost of five, just like Loatheb and Druid of the Claw. But Tidings requires three of any mana and then two specifically blue mana to play, where Sliver Queen requires one of five different colors to play, and that is far more difficult to do. So Sliver Queen, in terms of raw power, is just more bang for your buck than Tidings because its five is a much harder five than uh, Tidings is. And that actually gives Magic way more granularity in their costs. Whereas at Hearthstone, everything that costs five costs five. Magic can actually do a, there are lots of like essentially decimals in the cost that they're able to do for balancing cards. And that gives them an extra knob to turn. Tidings, you can make slightly better and then just make the mana cost have more blue in it or they could have it do an additional effect and put a different color of mana in it. That makes the card harder to play, but it gives you more knobs to turn when you're balancing things like that. And that also starts to get into how the power curves are different for these, car for these games. Because in Hearthstone, you generate a mana every turn and there's no resource that you have to play out of your hand to do that. Whereas in Magic, you do not get a mana every turn. You can get a maximum of one mana every turn, but you have to play a card from your hand and it relies on you drawing that. That means that in Hearthstone, Hearthstone needs to bribe you with more power to play low cost cards. A one cost card in Hearthstone relatively is more powerful than a one cost card in Magic. These up here are maybe a year or two old at this point, but some very popular one cost cards in the associated games. Tunnel Trog was a beast when it came out and was at the cornerstone of many powerful uh, Shaman decks. Northshire Cleric to this day is played in a ton of Cleric decks. It is a ton of power at one cost cards. Whereas you look at Expedition Envoy and Anointer of Champions, these are pretty basic cards that do little to nothing and just have stats on them, but they were considered solid cards in the Magic decks they were played in because they only cost one, and you need that flexibility more in Magic than you do in Hearthstone. If you wait a turn or two in Hearthstone, you will always be able to play your more expensive card, whereas in Magic, your curve does not go up automatically, so you need to make sure that you have cards that you can always play when you haven't drawn up to your specific mana point. Conversely, because of that, Magic's cards at higher costs give way more power than Hearthstone's cost, cards at those similar costs. Uh, Piloted Sky Golem, Emperor Thracian, both really powerful six cost cards in Hearthstone, but the associated white cards from that same era, the Subjugator Angel and the Navala the Preserver, Subjugator Angel can just end games when you play it, and Linvala is one of the biggest comeback cards that's been printed in Magic that's, been, that's viable. These cards just have tremendous amounts of power because by time you hit six in Magic, that is usually a much later point in the game compared to Hearthstone. You're probably talking turn eight at the minimum, if not like turn 10 or something. So as you get up there, you need more and more power you get more and more power payoff from Magic because they have to bribe you to bring you along to convince you to play higher cost cards because it is hard for the game to go that long in Magic. So that gives us two different looking power curves and it's, this isn't super great here. These are not official or anything. These are basic estimates here. But Hearthstone's power curve is higher at the low end but Magic's outpaces it pretty sharply as you go along. So on Magic, your sixth turn is not likely to give you a six cost card. Higher mana costs require more mana commitment in your deck, and Magic needs to bribe players more to play their expensive cards, and they get more granularity with their mana system. Hearthstone, one mana every turn, your deck doesn't need any mana support in it, and it needs to bribe you to play low cards, because if you just wait around, you're always gonna get to play your more expensive card. More expensive card, excuse me. Um, and then some games have some really weird curves like Pokemon. The cost in a Pokemon card is the stage. These are all basic Pokemon. These are the Pokemon that you can put directly into play, Lapras, Pikachu, and Froakie. However, as we all know, you can evolve Pokemon, 
and you can evolve that Pikachu into a Raichu and that Froakie into a Frogadier, and that Frogadier can evolve even further into a Greninja. So there are these three points of, of cost in Pokemon that you can get, but then there are even more powerful, color, more powerful cards in Pokemon called EX and GX cards, and these cards are basic, but as you can see, if you just look at the hit points on those cards in the top right corner, Darkrai and Groudon have significantly more than even the stage two card Greninja, and the damage that they do, if you can see next to like Mountain Rend, is much higher than what Miss Slash is doing on Greninja. And that is because they have costs that you pay on the back end. Pokemon, if you have not played it, is a game usually won by defeating six of your opponent's Pokemon, and when you each time you defeat an opponent's Pokemon, you get a prize card. When you defeat an EX Pokemon, you get two prize cards. However, you don't pay that cost until you have lost that resource. So you do not pay it going in, you pay it on the way out, and only as you're losing ground. And so some mega Pokemon can even evolve. But that gives Pokemon a really different power curve compared to a lot of games that you get this chunky curve. There are very few points of granularity in the Pokemon power curve, and it varies up and down wildly because if you don't pay all the costs up front, you pay some of the costs on the back end. So the Pokemon stage determines time. You have to wait a turn for each stage of evolution that you do in Pokemon and your deck commitment. To play a stage two Pokemon, you need more cards committed to that Pokemon. If I'm going to play four EX Pokemon, I put those in my deck. If I want to play Greninja, I need four Froakies and four Frogadiers and four Greninjas. So that eats up more of your deck space, giving you less flexibility. And then the EX Pokemon give up that extra prize on the way back. So Pokemon compared to Magic and Hearthstone, each Pokemon has to start from basic no matter what turn it is, and the time is per Pokemon, and it gets reset every turn. There's no plateauing of power like you would get in Magic and Pokemon. You don't reach a, or Magic and Hearthstone. You don't reach a point where just huge cards can be played every turn like in Magic and Hearthstone. You're always starting out at the beginning with the same lowest card. So it has a very different flow to it, and that causes the card design to be very different in those two games. Very briefly, I'm gonna talk about Clash Royale. It's a real-time strategy game, but it still has a collectible object element to it. Uh, real-time strategy games are hard to discuss in these terms because usually it's combos baiting and reacting that tell you more about the card's power level in general. In StarCraft, uh, Banelings are not something you're just gonna build if you're playing Zerg, but if they've got a lot of Marines, maybe you should make a Bane lead or two to start going in that direction. In Clash Royale, skeletons for one cost are not a great card. They don't, it's not gonna be a central part of your strategy, but you use it to distract other cards that your opponent has played. And this gives a whole other different mana system compared to uh, Magic, Hearthstone, or Pokemon that really doing a power curve almost makes less sense because it is in a constant rise and fall of power. You are constantly building up a power reserve that you expend when you play those cards thus reducing how much you have at that time, but it is constantly building, give you a rise and fall and that happens within that. Um, and that is briefly and very quickly <laughs> a general uh, discussion of power curves. Um, if you have, want the questions or the slides, they will be in the vault at some point. Again, this is my contact information. If there are any questions, we do have a microphone here. I think we've got about two-ish minutes left, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 10-ish. 10, 10-ish, 10 we got about 10-ish minutes left, so I did blow through that pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so if we have some questions, there's a microphone right there, and then when we are done, I will go to the overflow zone over there. Uh, make sure that you fill out your evaluations that you'll be getting for this talk. We'll ask you your favorite number. Your favorite number is five. Hi, so uh, a question is about uh, power creep. Uh, when we are developing a game, if it's a new game, uh, that won't come up very often. But an older game like Magic, Hearthstone, uh, or Pokemon, eventually you, you print cards that are just better, strictly better than previous cards. Um, when, as a designer, when, when is it okay to do that? Um, why does it come out so often? And, why? <laughs> well, a lot of that depends on the game and the philosophy that they have behind the game. 
Um, for example, in Magic, some of the most powerful cards ever were printed in the first set, and there are cards that will never equal the power level of those cards. Um, but there are cards that get printed in Magic that are just better, sometimes even within the same set. Um, what, what happens there a lot of the time, and th that comes into uh, doing rotation within your collectible object game. Hearthstone does it, Pokemon does it, Magic does it, but not every game does do that. And with rotation, you are always able to take chunks out of the game and always have this newer section of, of elements that are in the game. By doing that, you're going to be able to hit different points, like, uh, well, I forget it right now, in Hearthstone, when the mech set came out, there was the vanilla 3-4 for 3 that came out, and that card just didn't exist. And now that card is left, and now there is no 3-4 for 3. So it allows you to have different holes to make players make interesting decisions. Magma Rager was, of course, like the 5-1 the for 3, I think. Yeah. And they, it's, it was always kind of a joke card. Like, even in fiction, they made jokes about how bad Magma Rager was. And eventually, they printed the 5-2 at that same exact cost. So sometimes by looking at your curves and seeing what cards are and aren't being played, yeah, you're gonna occasionally print some cards that are strictly better than that. And sometimes you'll learn over time that your granularity has been off. Uh, small numbers are incredibly dangerous in card games. And Pokemon did kind of a rebalancing, I'm gonna say eight years ago with the black and white set, where the smallest number in the game was often one. And that is a very dangerous number because the, the next number you can go to is two, which is twice as big. And so it's very hard to make a small adjustment to the number one because you can either completely get rid of it or move it to that. So they boosted the base HP of a lot of things and up the base damage of a lot of things. And now there's kind of this new normal in Pokemon, but I don't, but as you, if you look over like the Sun Moon series, it's not significantly higher compared to the XY series. So it's just a lot of, a lot of things going there. But some games actually just, just do it as a sales mechanism where they just constantly creep it up and up and up because it's a lot, sometimes it's because the design space isn't that big. Like Magic, Pokemon, Hearthstone, there's a lot of design space in those games, but some games just don't have that design space. So to keep people interested in buying the new boosters or whatever, they do have to do that. But usually rotation means that it's, Never, it's just, well, sure, I mean, like Dr. Boom, right? Dr. Boom was the card in Hearthstone for a very long time, but now it's just not legal in standard play. So it allows them to do those resets and take chances, right? If they never print something as good as that, if they, if they are never printing cards that they have to pull back, they're probably not pushing hard enough. And so you, there's always a balance there of how, do, how powerful do we make this card? So yeah, it's, it can be complicated. Hi. Um, so you touched a little bit about, uh, in that answer, about kind of granularity and the fact that it's you know, one or two or three, and you, you can't go in between those too much. But in miniatures games like Warhammer, War Machine, stuff like that, the costs are much more granular. You know, Warhammer, there'll be 132 points for this vehicle and 130 points for this other vehicle. Does that granularity, would that help more to, to balance in card games like this, or is it just sort of a false sense of confidence? It's a, it's a different resource that you're balancing at that point, right? Because usually in a miniatures game like Warhammer, if I have a 132 point orc tank, I don't have to wait till I get to the 132 points in the game to be able to put my orc tank out. That's just in my army. And it's a summation so that your total army has an equivalent power to this total army that you're, that you're likely to be facing. But you're gonna start with all of that in play at one time. So some games do, some collectible object games do do something like that. They'll like put stars on cards and say you can have seven stars in your deck. And those will similar, usually be like more powerful cards in the game and they try to balance it off that. But it, it is a different system that you're looking at with miniatures, but those do give a lot of granularity. And since the numbers usually are much higher on that, that is a, that is a deck construction versus a object playing scheme that you're talking about there. And yeah, that, that, turns it, that does turn it on its head a little bit. But that granularity is very nice because th those numbers are usually so high and give you enough granularity that you can always just like 
make a unit however you think it needs to be if it's something in fiction. This is the org general, he needs to be able to do this. You can always just tweak that number plus or minus one a lot until you find the place that it, it finds out. And a lot of time those costs are set to either encourage or discourage combos from existing within those games as well. Thank you. Uh, so you spoke about uh, Hearthstone and you spoke about uh, magic. Um, and in one, you have a constant resource generation that's going up every turn. Um, in the other, you're looking for specific resource generators. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the original um, uh, Warcraft uh, card game that, that uh, was the precursor, basically, to Hearthstone. Um, in that, there was a mechanic where you could take any card from your hand and actually play that as a resource. Um, where do you think that falls among those power curves? Do you think that's kind of in between the two? Or, or what is your opinion on that? Uh, the question is about the original Hearthstone card game uh, in its similarity and differences, or the original Warcraft card game, and its similarity and differences to both Magic and Hearthstone's mana system. You can take any card from your hand and play that as a resource. And in a way, it is closer to Magic because you have to give up a card resource from your turn, and, and to be able to play that as a mana card, I think is what they were called, I forget at this yeah. point. Uh, so it is a little similar to that, but again, there is no typing, and that is where magic gets a lot of its actual, its actual granularity comes from the different colors of magic, and that also gives them ability to make very powerful cards that just is hard for you to meet in the same deck. So that, that's where a lot of that comes from, but yeah, it is probably closer to, to uh, Hearthstone still, because if you ever really wanted to, you could play a card from your hand to become that but you would eventually run out of hand resources if you did that every turn. Right. But yeah, it's, it's probably still closer to Hearthstone, but, not, but it is still off from, it's still probably in between Hearthstone and Magic, but it's probably closer to Hearthstone. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, so I've played Hearthstone, Pokemon, and Magic for years now, and um, seeing them through many different iterations. Um, do you think that it's healthy to have cards that are so far off the power curve that they create a meta for the game? Designing it preemptively, of course. Um, and looking specifically at Shaman Pokemon example, Doc or Hearthstone as well, like Dr. Boom, Shaman EX, Zoroark GX, and um, uh, Tapu Lele. Tapu Lele. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Pokemon tends to have a lot, because Pokemon is a very... Similar to Hearthstone, there's another IP going on at the time, and where Magic gets to kind of set, it, set its own IP within itself, mm -hmm. like they want to make a good Jace, they make a good Jace because it makes sense. Whereas Pokemon will have kind of pressures coming from different angles, right? And the Tapu Guardians were very important in the video games, and so that is something that, that we wanted to push within the Pokemon card game. So you'll get something like that. And usually with Pokemon, you will see that those cards are more of engine cards than combat cards with like Shaman, although Tapu Lele is a decent attacker as well. So it's, it's interesting uh, that a lot of games that are, have a more varied IP tie will tend to do that for brand reasons, almost more than like gameplay reasons. But the game also is like played around that. E you know, even when Tapu Lele first came out, very few decks were focused around it. It's still a utility card in a lot of games. So yeah, having specific cards that skew, the, skew themselves around the meta, I think is going to happen in various games. It's happened in every game, right? And cards have to either get controlled or counters come up or counter strategies come around it if something becomes very dominant. Just following up on that. Sure. Do you think it's also because of the chunky balance curve that Pokemon presents? The chunky balance curve in Pokemon does have a great deal to do with it because there's so little granularity. It is tough to make like a, GX, a basic GX that is in one direction or the other without like the HP is maybe your biggest style that you can really do with that. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. hey. This so is our last one, I think, go ahead. Cool, so when you're uh, developing the cards and you're, uh, you have your cost and you're trying to plot it on the curve, can you accurately, before you've released the game, maybe through play testing, determine where that actually falls in a ratio or is that something that evolves in the metagame? The question is, can you accurately predict where on a power curve an individual card is going to fall? And the answer is usually, uh, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of times, I mean, as game designers, that's our job. And we usually are, you know, you'll, I think Gavin Very just posted an article today about some very famous cards in Magic with, that has the developer comments from them. 
And it's interesting to see someone saying like, I'm going to push this card, I'm going to try to make this be an important card for this next format, or I don't think this is very good, let's see if we can bring it up, or this card is not supposed to be as important, let's bring it down a little bit. So the idea is you're always gonna know where it is, but like, even with, I mean, even with like, Wizards' R&D department or Pokemon's R&D department, which are probably, and Hearthstone, right? Those are probably some of the most focused R&D cost balance houses on the planet, but that's not as good as 100,000 people playing 10 million games, right? They're never gonna hit every single, every single combination in there and just stuff is gonna slip through and it's just not everything is gonna be there because the power of collectible object games, why they're so fun is because there literally are 200,000 decks you could go build right now. And so, yeah, we think we know where it's gonna be. Sometimes we're wrong though, so. Thank you. Yeah, and that's the talk. Thanks for coming everybody.